I've been wondering about motivations recently, about why I make a decision one way or the other, what's behind it. And I've been reflecting and realised that so many decisions in my life come down to either choosing what's best for me or choosing what's best for others. That's the, 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 the real dynamic under most things. Uh, if I want to put a spiritual lens on that, I can say maybe uh, in my decision making is it do I assert myself? Do I assert my own power or privilege in a situation? Or do I follow the course that Jesus has set out for me? There's a a passage of scripture that I wrestle with continually. It says that uh, our faith is like walking a narrow road. And it's really difficult. But there's another road that's really easy to walk. And our decisions come down to which path we choose. Well, today we're going to conclude our uh, walk through John chapter 11. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd love for you to open them up. We're going to read uh, from verses 47 to 57, the, the final portion of this passage of Scripture. Yeah, John chapter 11 recounts Jesus, uh, this moment where Jesus resurrects a man called Lazarus. And in this moment, he showcases his divine power. He tells everyone who he is. And in this process, in this moment, he is prompting us to believe in the one who sent him, our Father in heaven, and enter into relationship with him. And in today's passage, we uh, encounter a pivotal moment where those in positions of power and authority react to Jesus' undeniable miracle. We see what happens when uh, the, the, the authority of God meets our authority in life. It results in this confrontation between the impulse to embrace power or to embrace, embrace God's presence. And it's the same struggle that is echoed in every decision we make today. So we're going to read John chapter 11 from verse 47. Um, if you haven't been part of this journey in this series, let me just recap you to where we are. So Jesus has been uh, camping out in the wilderness with his, his disciples, his closest followers. And someone, uh, uh, this, uh, two sisters, Mary and Martha, send him word and say, uh, Lazarus, your close friend, the one you love, he is really sick and you need to come and heal him. And instead of rushing right back, Jesus delays his journey. And he delays it so much that when he actually shows up at Lazarus' house, he's no longer sick, he's passed away. And he hasn't just missed the opportunity to heal, yet he's missed the funeral. Lazarus has been dead and in his grave for four days. He meets Mary and Martha in their grief. And in their grief and in their pain, they still love Jesus. And they still understand that he's sent from God and his mission to the world. And Jesus says, I'm going to do something right now that really showcases that. And he goes in grief and in tears for the sin that is consuming this world. And he commands Lazarus to come out of his grave. It is this dramatic and you know, horrific moment where Lazarus emerges and he, Jesus commands, take off the grave clothes. And it is like Lazarus has been transformed. He was dead and now he is alive. Jesus does this miracle. And there is two groups of people gathered there uh, who have uh, made decisions about what they believe. There's one group who is starting to follow Jesus like, oh, look what he's done. Obviously, this guy's from God. And there's another group of people who are threatened by what they see. And that's what we read from John chapter 11, verse 47 today. It says, Then the leading priests and the Pharisees called the high council together. And they're like, what, what are we going to do about what's happening with this Jesus guy? 
And they, they asked each other, they said, oh, he's performing so many miraculous signs. What are we going to do? If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. Oh, that's a bad outcome. Then the, the, the Roman army will come and they'll destroy our temple and our nation. Everything we uh, have power and control over will disappear. And Caiaphas, who was the high priest at the time, said, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Don't you realize it's better for one man to die so that the people, uh, for the people so that the whole nation won't be destroyed? And he didn't say this on his own. The high priest, he was the high priest at the time, he was led to prophesy that Jesus would die for the entire nation. He says, and, and not only for that nation, but to bring together and unite all of God's children that are scattered around the world. So from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot the death of Jesus. And as a result, Jesus stopped his public ministry among the people and he left Jerusalem. He went to a place near the wilderness to the village of Ephraim and stayed there with his disciples. And it was now almost the time for Passover. And many people from all over the country arrived at Jerusalem several days early so they could go through the ritual purification ceremony before the Passover began. And they kept looking for Jesus. But as they stood around in the temple where he usually hang out, uh, hung out, they said to each other, you know, what do we think is going to happen? Will he come for the Passover? What's going to happen next? Meanwhile, the leading priests and Pharisees had publicly ordered anyone seeing Jesus to report it immediately so they could arrest him. This is the word of the Lord. And it asks us to reflect on the stark choices that we have between embracing God's presence or embracing worldly power. Are you with me? We'll get there then. Every challenge that we face... Oh, something's happened there. All right. It's all good. Uh, every challenge we face is born from a choice. We either protect our own power or we embrace godly truth. We embrace God's presence in a situation, even if it costs us. And I, I think this, we should actually take some mo a moment right now to reflect on that in our own lives. Um, because we, we might not think that it is strictly true. We might not see it in our own lives straight away. So here's a couple of prompts for us then. Now, have there been times in your life where you have been holding on to a grudge because it's easier than offering forgiveness? Thank you, sister, for your honesty. That is embracing a worldly power over godly uh, power. Uh, you know, we, we hold on to grudges or sometimes we believe the lie that we're somehow better than other people, that uh, we're above showing someone else kindness. You know, how, what, why would I bother to deal with them? We elevate ourselves over others. You know, sometimes we refuse to let go to something we feel entitled to. You know, this is mine. I earn this. I deserve this. Why should they get a share in this? And when we hold on like that, it causes a rift in our relationships with others. Here's one that strikes home for me. Uh, uh, there's a lot of parents in the room. Um, I, I wonder, parents or, or kids, if you've ever heard this from your parents, uh, you're instructed to, to do something and you ask why, and the answer is... Because I said so. Very good. Yeah, that was, there was a lot of people in that. Okay. Yeah, because I said so. There's that parental uh, imperative that says, do what I say because it's good for me. 
I don't want to take the time to explain it. Where it's embracing our power and asserting ourselves over others. But we even see this in church. Oh, this is hard to say, isn't it? We, we sometimes, sometimes, we hold on to our preferences and how we think things should happen. We hold, our, hold on to our preferences over ways of doing things, over being in step with the Holy Spirit. We say, my comfort is more important than asking God, what should we be doing? And that is also asserting our power over others. You know, I want it to be this way because it makes me happy. Sometimes we, we find ourselves doing these things. Sometimes we find ourselves asserting our power over others. But I, I bet every single person in this room and everyone joining us online could say that you've also been on the receiving end of someone else's embrace of power. You know, there's, there's, someone else has made a choice. Someone wanted to come out on top over you. They wanted the acclaim. So they made a choice to push you down, to push you aside, to embrace their own power instead of asking what is good for everyone. You know, that, that's, the, that's an improper use of power. But we're all in this together. We've received it. We've done it. Right? Yeah. Yes. We are all in this together. We've all made choices to protect power, sometimes at the expense of others. And we've all felt the repercussion of other people's power-driven decisions. So how do we process this? How do we deal with it? I think this word today helps us understand it and draw closer to being in step with God. Because these struggles aren't unique to us. Even in Jesus' time, people were choosing to protect power over uh, helping others. You know, after Jesus performed these, the, the astonishing miracle of raising Lazarus from the grave, the religious teachers at the time, those in power, they found themselves at a crossroads between in God's presence and worldly power. They had this choice to make. They could either assert themselves or they could submit themselves to the obvious power of God that was on display in the world around them. And it was a difficult choice for them and it's a difficult choice for us to walk the narrow road. Now, uh, let's go back to the scripture, verse 47. It says, The leading priests and the Pharisees called the high council together. They said, you know, what are we going to do? This is rocking our world. This is eroding our power base. You know, this is uh, uh, coming against us and every bit of control that we have. He said, you know, this, this man, he certainly performs many miraculous signs. He's proving who he is. If we allow him to go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And they will follow him and not us. And then a Roman army will come in and they'll destroy our temple, our power base and our nation. I think it's good maybe just to step back from this text for a moment and do a bit of a history lesson. Um, I'll try not to make it too boring. Uh, but uh, in this moment, there's something interesting going on. At the time of Jesus' ministry, uh, a provisional government has been set up in Israel. We have uh, these... Uh, and they set up this government in anticipation of the Messiah. They said... Um, uh, one day our king is going to come and he's going to rule over Israel and he's going to usher in this time of peace and he's going to uh, cast out our enemies and all of these prophecies are going to come to fruition. So what's the best thing we can do? We can set up all the structures so everything's ready for him when he comes. So they set up a council called the Sanhedrin. It is the place where all the Jewish elders would gather and they would do the day-to-day -day administration of, uh, of the country. You know, they'd make all, you know, sort of like a parliament, making those sorts of decisions. And then they also had this other seat of power, which is the temple. And in the temple was the high priest. 
And the, the Sanhedrin had this day-to-day -day responsibility, but the high priest, he had kingly responsibility. He was invested with all the power and authority that the king over Israel would have. And the Sanhedrin and the high priest, they set up these powers and, and responsibilities and with this understanding uh, that one day the Christ would come. One day the Messiah would come. One day the king would come to claim his rightful place on the throne of Israel. They were just keeping it warm for him. So enter Jesus. They see the king. He, uh, they, they see the authenticating signs. They see the power that he comes in that points to his coronation. They see the power displayed in raising Lazarus from the grave. And in response, those in positions of power, those in positions of authority, voluntarily set aside their power and they said, welcome Jesus, come and sit on your throne. Right? No. No. In, in fear, in sin, in a desire to hold on to the power that they had gained over years of service, they begin to make a choice that is self-interested. They begin to make a choice to preserve their power. They say, my power, my position is more important than God's presence. And they're saying that literally. They're saying, we are more important than God dwelling among us. And then Caiaphas enters the chat. It says Caiaphas was the high priest at the time. And there was lots of conversation going on in the Sanhedrin and in the, the temple. And some were saying, oh, maybe he's the one. Maybe we should step aside. And others were saying, no, no, no. And Caiaphas is listening to all of his conversation. He's like, you guys, you do not know what you are talking about. We need to take some decisive action right now. You don't realize that it's better for one man to die for the people than the whole nation to be destroyed. You know, Caiaphas the high priest, he prophesied that it's better than one man to die than the whole nation to suffer. And this is a, I want to say accidental prophecy on his behalf, but it's not. He just doesn't know what he's saying. The Holy Spirit comes and gives him uh, uh, words, but he doesn't have eyes to see or ears to hear to understand what is going on in this moment. But with uh, our experience, we know the depth of what is going on here. Although this prophecy pointed to Jesus' sacrifice, his motives are rooted in self-interest. You know, there's the choice to preserve world that the choice to preserve worldly power led to the plot against Jesus. And this mirrors our struggle today in every decision that we make. You know, choosing sin to maintain power, even if it ignores the truth of our circumstances the truth of what God is speaking to our lives, even if it means hurting others. Now, if, if this is sinful behavior, then we know what the consequences of sin is, don't we? The consequence of sin is? Death. And that's what they planned for Jesus. They said, so from that time on, the Jewish leaders planned and plotted Jesus' death. My friends, there is something for us to discern in this text today. There's something for us to learn and embrace together. There is two choices that we have in most moments of our lives. Either we can align ourselves with God's will, with his power, with his kingdom, or we can cling to worldly power to elevate ourselves, to make ourselves feel better. We have these two choices to make. You know, we can, uh, and sin, sin is choosing to maintain and grow our power. Do we all understand that one? Yeah? 
choosing to maintain and grow our power, choosing to elevate ourselves over others, choosing what's best for us when we ignore the things God is telling us and the way that we should live, that is sinful behavior that takes us away from God and away from others. Sin is choosing to maintain and grow power and this sinful choice, it is at the root of all the world's problems. This sinful choice is at the root of all the church's problems. This sinful choice is at the root of all your problems. This sinful choice is at the root of all my problems. Something they did, something you did, something we did. We make a choice to maintain and grow power apart from the will of God and it leads to hurt it leads to relationships breaking down, it leads to trouble, it leads to pain, and it leads to death. A physical death and a spiritual death and the death of our relationships with others. Sin is choosing to maintain and grow this power in the face of what God is putting in front of us. But in contrast, Jesus has power. It is different and he wields it differently. Jesus' power brings life and restoration and hope. We need to align ourselves to God's will to choose a narrow path to walk. Aligning ourselves to God's will means choosing to put aside power that lifts us up to put aside power that dominates for power, putting aside power that leads to death, for power that leads to life. Jesus uses power to restore what is broken, to push back against sin and death and its consequences. Jesus uses his power to bring life. Jesus uses his power to bring hope. Jesus uses his power to bring restoration. And he uses it to build a future for his people. And when we embrace it, he uses his power through us to save the world around us. Jesus' power lifts people up. This is different from the world's power, which pushes people down. Jesus used his power to mend what is broken, to heal what is hurting, and to breathe life into what seems dead. And it is as stark as speaking to a grave and expecting a dead man to rise. That is the extent of his power. It brings life. Jesus lifts people up and we see this all through the word. You can open your Bible to any part in Jesus' ministry and you can see him lifting people up. Maybe you can picture some of those moments right now. Maybe you can picture Jesus reaching out to the person afflicted with leprosy, that person who was isolated from society, that person pushed to the margins by everyone else because they didn't want to deal with it. In your mind's eye, picture Jesus drawing close to this person, bringing physical healing that restores their place in community that restores their dignity. Or maybe you can picture the woman at the well, the, the woman who has such a, a big past and such a burden that she comes out in the heat of the day to get water from the well. She comes out in the heat of the day and she is carrying the weight of her past. She is carrying the weight of shame. She's carrying the burdens of other people's uh, power over her who are shaming her and pushing her away. And here she encounters Jesus at the well, the place of living water. And in this moment, she obtains a new identity and a new purpose. Jesus lifts people up. Or maybe you can flick through your Bible and find a guy called Zac uh, Zacchaeus. 
You know, this is guy who collaborated with the, the Roman Empire, with the enemy of the people. He stood up and said, I'll be a tax collector. I will, uh, I will lord it over everyone else. And Jesus sees this man and he doesn't bring him to condemnation. No, he goes to his house and he offers forgiveness. And in response, there is this outpouring of generosity from Zacchaeus. Jesus' power encounters people on the margins. Jesus' power uh, uh, encounters those who are using power over others. Jesus' power changes. Uh, changes people's lives and it lifts them up. Turn to the person next to you and say, he lifts you up. He lifts you up. And if we continue looking for our Bibles at what Jesus does, we can find him at the cross where worldly power seemed to have the upper hand, where the justice of the world came upon him. We see Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. And in that process, it lifts the burden of sin from humanity. It lifts it from you and lifts it from me. And in its place, there is this promise of new life, better life and eternal life and reconciliation with God. His resurrection shatters the finality of the grave and it offers hope to all creation. Jesus' power is not about control or domination. It is about lifting others up, breaking the chains of sin, breaking the chains of oppression and ushering in a kingdom where his love and purpose reigns supreme. Yet we are not here to create our own kingdoms. Amen? Amen? We're not here to create our own kingdoms. We're not here to dominate. We're not here to rule over others. We are part of Jesus' kingdom on earth. We are here to be his hands and his feet to the world around us. And, it, and, and when we realize that, when we own that, it brings us in the, the, into the full possession of our humanity. It makes us fully what God created us to be. It is our purpose to express God's love to the world around us under the crown of our King, Jesus. So what are our next steps? What do we do with this today? How do we take this from Sunday into the rest of our week? Um, I've got a few thoughts I'm going to share. And and it starts with this idea that worldly power exists to keep you from your purpose. Worldly power exists to keep you from your purpose. So how do we combat that? How do we stand against that? Well, friends, we, we have to do some stuff that's hard. And it begins with confession. It begins with recognizing those things that we are doing, have done, that, uh, that, that we assert our own power and our own control in life, where we choose to dominate or, or force others to do the things that we want instead of considering where Jesus is leading. It begins with confession, which is uh, uh, looking deep inside with Jesus at your side and finding those strongholds that are in your heart and saying, I I don't want to live that way anymore. I don't want that thing to have control over me. I want to live with Jesus' crown above my head and not my own crown. So it begins with uh, with confession. The Apostle Paul encourages us when we come to communion I could have done this instead. Uh, he, 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 uh, he encourages us when we come to communion to not take those emblems until we've made ourselves right with our brothers and sisters. It's that same idea that we hold grudges or we hold power or we hold control over others and we need to lay that down at the feet of Jesus and take on his presence in our lives. So we begin, begin with confession And we continue by embracing Jesus' truth in our lives. 
Now, this bit that I'm about to do is really difficult. Um, I've said this before, and it is always true, that when I am here and I am preaching or teaching, I'm speaking to myself. I'm not talking to you so much, I'm talking to myself. When I open up the Word and and God uh, takes me on a journey through those passages, He's talking to me first, and and I just get to share that with you. So I'm going to ask some questions in a moment to help uh, break this down about what truths you need to embrace. And I want you to know that this doesn't come from a place of criticism. It doesn't come from a place of me thinking I'm better than you. These are the questions I'm asking myself in my own life. And I think when we do this together, we're able to put down worldly power and embrace Jesus' presence more fully in our lives. Are you with me? Excellent. So I've got four questions I'm going to ask you to help break this one down. Four things that help us understand the strongholds in our lives and draw closer to Jesus. And the first question is this. What truths have you been resisting in your life? Are there things that you have been hearing from God and you've been putting them at arm's length? And you you, you hear in your spirit or in your devotional time, God leading you somewhere and he's speaking something over your life about a, a stronghold, something that needs to break and you just push it aside. What truths have you been resisting? Here's the second question. What voice have you been silencing or keeping at a distance to avoid hearing what you instinctively know to be true? What voice? It could be um, the Holy Spirit. It could be God speaking through others in your life. But what voice have you been silencing or, or keeping at arm's length? to avoid hearing what you know to be true because you don't want to deal with it, because you don't want to actually follow through with it. Again, I'm asking myself this, all right? The third question, how has the Lord confronted you lately? Have you had moments where you you, you feel like Jesus is saying something to you about uh, uh, something you're doing in life and and you're like, oh, I I don't want to deal with that. How has the Lord confronted you lately? I'm not going to dig into that more than than that. But I know it's a question for someone here. The fourth question. Have you drowned out your own conscience with activity or work or relationships or busyness or some other kind of escape? Our world offers us so many things to keep us entertained. There is so many things we can throw ourselves into, to hobbies or, or, or work, or we can just binge uh, episode after episode after episode of something. And we do this sometimes because we don't want to confront those things that God is speaking into our heart. So what truths do you need to embrace today? Because when we lean into this, we find real truth that sets us free. We find truth that sets us free from the power of sin, from the power of others, and we get to live the life that Jesus has called us to, to live our purpose, which worldly power keeps us from. And this is the last thing I'm going to say. Is it's really difficult to do this alone. It's really hard. So my encouragement is to gather with others and share truth together to gather with others. We join together on Sundays. That is fantastic. It is a really important part of our spiritual journey where we get to encourage each other together. We join in unity together. But another way you can do that is through a life group. 
that you can gather during the week with others and you can share your lives together. You can talk about your struggles together. You can receive prayer from others. You can open up the word of God and allow it to speak to your heart and find someone to keep you accountable to what you are reading. When we gather with others, we find a place where we can uh, grow in freedom, where we can find grace and love and care, and we can talk openly and honestly about our problems. Because we don't want to come up here and share it right now. You don't want to broadcast your problems to everyone. You don't want to tell everyone on the live stream what's going on in your life. But when you gather in a life group, you have this opportunity to grow relationship and deep relationship with others, to grow in care and concern, and know that they are not embracing worldly power, but together you are embracing spiritual power to see those things in your life overcome. 